Well, thank you very much for uh, your kind words and thank you very much for the invitation to give this lecture. I was myself at a young statisticians meeting uh, uh, long ago, a long time ago, the fifth one. So we're now at the 23rd. And uh, I thought it would be uh, nice for this occasion then to uh, look back a little bit in history as, uh, and, and do some review and talk about some open problems. It's about uh, non-parametric Bayesian statistics. And uh, let me just start with uh, setting the notation for Bayes. Um, we uh, think in Bayesian statistics of the parameter as having been generated from a prior distribution, you know, the pi here, and then you get data that given the parameter comes from a, a likelihood or a measure P theta, you get a joint distribution for the data and the parameter, which you can write uh, in the way as uh, as given here. And uh, next, uh, the statistical inference is to get the conditional distribution of theta given the data x, and that's called the posterior distribution. If the model of uh, measures p theta have a likelihood, then there is Bayes' rule, and that's where the Bayesian statistics name comes from, and Bayes' rule then just says that the posterior distribution has a density relative to the prior, which is uh, just given by the likelihood uh, at the observed data. Now for non parametric Bayesian statistics, we cannot always use Bayes' rule because this assumption that uh, the model is dominated by some, some uh, measure mu is not always satisfied. But uh, in, in every case, the uh, abstract definition is always valid, but then you uh, have to sometimes define it as a disintegration. That is just that you uh, change the conditioning and uh, use Kolmogorov's definition of conditional probability. But it's always a conditional distribution of the parameter given the data. Now, Bayes himself, uh, well, we know Bayes' rule as a probability rule, but actually Bayes uh, solved the statistical problem. And in uh, our present day uh, notation, you could say uh, the theta was a success probability between zero and one, and he used a uniform prior on that. Then he considered a binomial experiment where the data is the number of successes and in, in independent trials with success probability theta. So you get the binomial distribution, and then the posterior distribution uh, has a density, which uh, takes this form, and that's a beta distribution. Um, a picture uh, says it all. Uh, so you he started with a prior, which is uh, the uniform measure on 0, 1, and then you get a posterior for a given uh, data point. And I chose as a special case, because otherwise you can't compute anything, that we have 20 trials and 13 successes. And then the idea is that the posterior distribution will center here, a bit bigger than 0.6, which is approximately 13 over 20. And then there is a certain spread in the posterior distribution, which uh, tells us something about the remaining uncertainty in sense of conf confidence statements about the parameter theta. That is parametric base. And uh, Bayes was not alone. It, uh, his method was uh, reinvented by Laplace soon after. Gauss actually also uh, did statistics in this way. It's maybe with uh, Fischer, beginning of last century, uh, that um, that some other idea came up, which was maximum likelihood. Fischer didn't like the uh, prior distribution, and so he advocated something only depending on the likelihood, which was maximum likelihood. The Bayesian method uh, became quickly more popular again when computational methods were developed in the uh, 1980s and 90s. And you could say that uh, for many applied scientists, I'll give some examples later, it is the method of choice because Bayesian statistics is the kind of natural way of thinking in terms of probabilities, if you can think of the correct prior, of course. Now, my talk is about non-parametric statistics and so non-parametric base and that is the case uh, when theta is not uh, a finite dimensional vector but is an infinite dimensional object like uh, a function or a distribution um, 
and then the prior and posterior are also probability distributions on the parameter set, which is then an infinite dimensional space. That doesn't change uh, base formalism in any any way, particularly if you have a dominated measure, which is still possible, you just still have base rule, but it becomes uh, a lot more complicated, of course, because you have to now handle uh, the distributions on in the infinite dimensional spaces. Uh, the first steps here were taken in the 1970s, um, but uh, before 2000, uh, everybody thought this wouldn't work, basically because uh, yeah, if you spread a probability distribution, this prior over an infinite dimensional set, then you have to put more mass at certain places than at other places, cannot do that uniformly, and so the posterior will not be a useful object. And there were also theoretical results from the 90s that suggested that that was the case. And this is uh, what uh, I'm going to investigate in this talk, and that we investigated in the past 20 years. Except there were very special cases where it did work and where it was known from the, the first steps. And I'll review that first. And that is uh, particularly the case of Bayesian distribution estimation. Just this problem, you get as a data, a sample from some distribution P, and you know nothing about P, you want to estimate the P. If you're not a Bayesian, then the empirical distribution function is the is the way to go. That is the 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 only natural thing you you would say that just puts weight one over n at all the observations, and uh, it gives a uh, approximation to the p by the law of large numbers. If the uh, observations are one dimensional, you can also um, talk about the empirical distribution function, the cumulative distribution function corresponding to the empirical. And it looks like in the picture where you see the black curve, uh, that is is the empirical distribution. And here, uh, this example is a sample of size 100 from a Cauchy distribution for some reason. That's not important. Uh, that's the, the red curve. And you see that works uh, fairly well if, uh, if this n, which is 100, is not too small. Now, if you're Bayesian, it's unfortunately not that easy because now you need to first put a prior over the set of all distributions, probability distributions, to come into business. And uh, that's far from obvious. But in the 1970s by Thomas Ferguson, there was this suggestion, and that is uh, still the standard prior that one uses in this situation, uh, the Dirichlet process. If you put a prior over probability distributions, then a draw from the prior would be a random measure. And a Dirichlet process is a random measure such that if you take some partition from the sample space, so the AI is a finite partition of the sample space where the X is fall, then the vector that you uh, make, so P is random, so this becomes a random vector, and that must be uh, a probability vector. And uh, the Dirichlet process, P has the Dirichlet process if that probability factor follows the Dirichlet distribution. And that is a uh, distribution on the unit simplex in RK, where the, the parameter, uh, which is a, a product of the coordinates with some powers. And the, the powers, uh, it's special that the powers are chosen uh, um, so that uh, the different partitions are related you have a parameter for the Dirichlet process, excuse me, which is a, a finite measure alpha. And for every partition, you take the parameters according to the, the measure of this alpha. Come on. No. In a picture that looks like this, in this picture, um, I took first... Uh, a sample of realizations from the Dirichlet process. That's the black curves. Then I took a sample of size 100 from a data distribution, uh, Cauchy again. And then I computed the posterior distribution and took a sample of curves from the posterior distribution. And that's the blue curves. And what you see is that the, the blue curves are in a different location than the black curves. And you also see that they are a bit more concentrated together. 
And in fact, they are concentrated around the true curve, which is uh, the red curve also in this picture. So the Bayesian analysis uh, works. Well, you can also prove that in a theorem. Uh, Ferguson uh, already showed that uh, in this setting, the posterior distribution. So if you have a prior Dirichlet process sample from the P, then the conditional of P given the data, the posterior distribution is another Dirichlet and it has a different parameter. So we start with uh, an alpha and then we get alpha plus NP, which is N times the, the empirical. And the idea is that if N is uh, large, then this NP N dominates and the alpha is almost not there. And uh, you get a Dirichlet that follows the data. Uh, the mean of the posterior distribution is almost the empirical. This is uh, up to an order one over n term, and that is basically that is alpha. If it wouldn't there, then the difference would be zero. And one also has that uh, deviations between the posterior, the, the fluctuations in these blue curves around the posterior mean, which is approximately the pn, uh, is like a Brownian bridge, which is the same uh, fluctuations as in the um, empirical distribution, which makes it exactly right to think of the fluctuations among the blue curves here as a measure of remaining uncertainty uh, that would define correct confidence intervals in the in the frequentist sense. I'll come back to that later. Now, what is nice or remarkable about this uh, Dirichlet process is that it's actually discrete distribution. Uh, if P is uh, is a sample from a Dirichlet process, you can get it as a discrete distribution with uh, weights, uh, theta i, drawn from some measure, namely the alpha renormalized, the parameter renormalized, and certain weights. I'm not going to uh, be precise about, uh, well, I'm precise here, but I'm not going to explain the details of the weights. Just it's a, a random measure with random locations and random weights, uh, countably discrete uh, measures. Well, why that would be the case, that has to do with the theorem due to Kingman, that if you have a random measure, Q, where the uh, measures of sets are independent for every partition, then it's necessarily discrete. So it always takes this form. And then uh, you could make a picture like it's uh, you, you first take uh, support points and then you get weights at every support point. So that's true for the Dirichlet. And that's then, of course, a recipe for making other priors. If you just change, the, for instance, the weights to some other distribution, you get a different prior. And now it becomes uh, uh, interesting that you have to be a bit careful. I give one example where things do change, and that's the pittman yor process, uh, developed not uh, in the concept of uh, Bayesian analysis very much, but um, in uh, the uh, context of uh, random partitions. And it changes the weight distribution a bit. And again, I'm not going into the details, but there's one parameter sigma. If that wouldn't be, would be zero, then you're back at the Dirichlet case. But this pittman yor as an extra parameter sigma, and you could vary that. Um, with the pittman yor you can do a similar experiment. You could uh, make uh, draws from the prior, and black, a number of draws. Then you get the data, so the same data as I had before. And then you can draw from the posterior. And in these pictures, you don't see much. But if I superimpose them, then you see that uh, the blue curves, they have moved a bit, but they haven't moved to the red curve, which is the true curve. So there's a very basic difference here between pittman yor and Dirichlet process prior. It does matter what the sigma is. And that, again, you can prove by a theorem that indeed you get, in a frequentist way of understanding, you get a bias if you use this as a prior. And it will be a bit hard to see from the the definition the, that uh, I give here. Now, there was a Bayesian distribution estimation. When you talk uh, about non parametric statistics, then you talk about lots of other pro uh, problems. 
more complicated problems like regression density estimation, high dimensional inference, like uh, high dimensional regression that's uh, considered almost non-parametric uh, data assimilation. I'll, uh, I'll tell you what that is in a moment. Uh, maybe network modeling, deep learning. Uh, people have done uh, um, that's high dimensional inference with a particular uh, type of, of model, diffusion processes, hierarchical models, um, and so on. And for all these uh, settings, there are nowadays non-parametric Bayesian approaches. And proponents like these approaches, and they claim uh, the following uh, following things. And I'm not uh, really uh, going to make the claim that it's all better and so on, but some people would. I, I would be uh, among the people who do like the methods for some of the reasons that uh, are listed here. Uh, one uh, reason might be to have automatic uncertainty quantification. The idea would be that the spread in the posterior distribution that you get, that would tell you uh, also uh, how believable, say, the posterior mean is as an estimate for the, for the parameter. There's automatic bandwidth tuning and many non-parametric problems, curve estimation. For instance, you have to insert in, you have to use some bandwidth in the problem and you have to set it in some way. In the Bayesian framework, you can just put a prior on it and it works remarkably well that uh, it is indeed almost automatically then based on the data, it chooses the correct bandwidth parameter. Uh, in the high dimensional case, uh, one could say that you can borrow strengths you, across data sets uh, with a Bayesian approach. Uh, this has been developed by Brad Efron, for instance, um, not in a fully Bayesian framework, but then becomes empirical base, uh, fits also in a story. And of course, you might incorporate prior information uh, if you have it, even uh, in, for instance, causal inference on parameters that you can't identify with the data, but you might have some idea about it and then you could put a prior on it, combine it in that way with, uh, with the data and the likelihood. Then in general, the Bayesian approach uh, is a generative probabilistic model. Um, it needs it, it provides it. Uh, um, you, you, you write a hierarchy that, that tells you how the parameters are uh, generated uh, possible latent variables and finally the observables and then uh, once you've done all that then getting the posterior distribution is kind of uh, well defined um, which uh, maybe is a nice feature of, uh, of thinking you have to make everything uh, explicit in your uh, description of this hierarchy which might make it difficult or which might make might help to make all your assumptions uh, very clear. Some examples of this uh, modern non-parametric Bayesian regression. Um, on the left side, you see a uh, one-dimensional uh, uh, regression problem, a curve fitting. We want to get uh, the best curve to the, the point. And in the left, I, ch I show three draws from some prior, which actually are draws from some Gaussian process. But um, they are straight lines, so they don't know what uh, the data, the prior doesn't know the, the data yet. Um, although I smuggled a bit that uh, the vertical heights of this uh, draws are clearly where the data are. And then uh, you do the usual updating and you get a posterior. Uh, you can draw from the posterior and you see those in the in the right uh, picture. The, there's uh, dashed curves here, which are draws from posterior. There are a, a number of them. And the red curve here is the average say of all of infinitely many draws or what is the same, the posterior mean, which would be the, the point estimator. And the hope would be that the spread that you see would be a bit like a confidence band. Here is Bayesian data assimilation. That is kind of regression, but uh, in, a, in a special setting. Um, the idea is that there is some function u, which depends maybe on uh, space and time uh, and a parameter theta that is not known. Um, and the function u is determined by some um, differential equation, a PDE typically, 
uh, something of the type uh, like here. Um, it describes some physical system, the evolution, uh, but uh, the physical system is not completely known. There's a parameter, it's called beta here, but it should be the theta in the general thing. <laughs> and then what is observed is the output of the system at uh, design point xi plus some, some noise, uh, say Gaussian noise, and uh, the idea is that uh, you would like to predict future of of this curve, uh, which indirectly means you need to get hold of the theta. This is done a lot by people in differential equations. And then to uh, get some hold of the uncertainty in the results, which uh, is uh, through these uh, errors, um, they do a Bayesian approach, which is just putting a prior on the theta and then getting the posterior somehow. Here's a particular example. Uh, you see uh, Antarctica shape, and uh, these authors in this paper, um, they went to great lengths in uh, constructing a Gaussian prior over a parameter, which is the resistance, more or less, um, of the ice mass uh, when it glides over the land in uh, Antarctica. That's this parameter uh, beta or theta here, uh, which is not known, but you, they, you can see the ice gliding from the land. And then to predict what the ice is going to do in the future, you need to estimate this uh, friction parameter. Um, you could do that by putting a prior on it. These are three draws from the prior. You get your data from the flow of the, the ice uh, on, on top. You have this uh, relationship, which is the the PDE that uh, connects the friction and uh, and the U, and you get your posterior from from there. And these are, uh, I think, three quantiles from the posterior. So the hope is to get not only a, a good estimate, but also uh, some some uh, margin around the estimates, some uncertainty margins. Uh, here's a last uh, example: high dimensional modeling, um, which is often also considered to be non-parametric. This is just uh, the regression model where uh, the, the regression parameter theta has dimension P and that's bigger than the number of observations. Then uh, you might model that by a prior. Uh, if you want to estimate theta, you need to impose some sparsity. And a typical way uh, in the Bayesian world to do that is to put a prior first on a sparsity level. Uh, this is a hierarchical model tau comes from a beta and then uh, given the tau um, the parameters p parameters are under the prior drawn from the from a slab spike and slab param parameter the the spike is uh, a direct mass at zero that has probability tau and with probability one minus tau it comes from the slab which is often taken a laplace distribution like in the lasso and um, that's um, that gives you a prior on the, the parameter vector, and then you just do the Bayesian uh, machine and you hope that it comes out well. Okay, that's uh, all very nice, but you might wonder, does it work? It's uh, certainly a method, uh, does it work? And you cannot uh, answer that question if you are uh, a complete uh, philosophical Bayesian, because then of course it works, you just get your prior and what else can you do then to, to get your posterior? But if you're sort of halfway, if you're a pragmatic Bayesian, then you can do something that is sometimes called a frequentist base. You assume that the data is actually generated to given parameter theta naught, and then you look whether the posterior can um, find that um, given parameter theta naught um, from the data. We consider the posterior as we reform the posterior given some prior, but we consider it just as a given random measure over the parameter set. And then we might want uh, two uh, properties. We would like uh, this posterior distribution to concentrate near the parameter if the x is indeed um, generated according to theta naught. So if there is a true parameter theta naught that gave the x, then the posterior at that x should be uh, 
concentrating near theta naught. I'll make it precise and in the next slide. Uh, and the second thing is uh, uncertainty quantification. Then you look at the full posterior distribution and that has a spread, uh, maybe around uh, the center or the posterior mean. And you would like that spread to, to tell you something about the theta naught in terms of say a confidence statement. Uh, we can study these uh, these these matters if if for a given prior you in, indeed have these desirable properties, and typically we then uh, study that in the asymptotic setting where the the data depends uh, on some parameter n, um, say the number of data points and the information in the data uh, increases as n goes to infinity, because it's very difficult to uh, say anything mathematical about these objects if uh, if you do that for a finite sample size. So it's always approximations. Now, what uh, would you get in parametric base? I'm interested in non-parametric base, but what would you get in parametric base if you if you did this? Um, that is uh, well summarized by uh, the Bernstein von Mises theorem, which is an old one, goes back to Laplace and uh, maybe the last version in uh, Lacan, 1986. So there is some history. And that says that the posterior distribution in the parameter case will start looking like a Gaussian uh, distribution. And this is a precise uh, statement of the theorem. Maybe I'll just point to these two pictures, not to spend too much time on this. Uh, here you see three uh, draws of the data that each draw of the data gives a uh, posterior density. This is in the binomial problem. Um, and what you see is that uh, the posterior density looks a bit Gaussian. Here is moderate uh, n, n is 20 here, n is, n is uh, 100. And you see then that uh, the posterior looks like a Gaussian. And of course, it depends on the, the data where it's located. Um, and typically, uh, what one can do is uh, one say it uh, will sit it will center approximately at the maximum likelihood estimator, which varies with the data. That's why the different curves have different centers. And then the spread in the posterior that decreases with, with n. If I go from this picture to the next one, then the, the width becomes smaller. Um, and that uh, width is given by the fissure information. That's a, a, a very nice theorem. It basically says that if you would now take intervals like this, uh, within a posterior distribution, you would say this is the uh, this this is my sort of confidence interval. It actually is a confidence interval. Bayesians call that a credible interval. If you take a ninety five percent central interval, but it's actually like a confidence interval due to this uh, theorem. Very importantly, also is that the prior here plays almost no role. If the prior just puts mass everywhere, it needs to have a positive density, then it's not in the first order asymptotics. So any prior will work in that sense. You cannot really uh, do it wrong. And that is different in the, in the non-parametric situation. For instance, there's dramatic uh, situations, these pictures that I showed where uh, with the pitman yor you get inconsistent uh, posterior inference with the Dirichlet, it was nice, it's like in a parametric case, but the pitman yor it doesn't uh, uh, work well. Now, let me look at a few examples of uh, what we now know. There's uh, a big literature in the meantime, but just uh, a few examples and uh, some uh, terminology to make these uh, questions uh, precise. First, there is the contraction rate of the posterior, which is defined in this way. Uh, we have data, and given the data xn, we form a posterior for a parameter theta. Um, there is a true parameter theta naught, and we equip the uh, parameter set with the metric d. Then the contraction rate of the posterior is said to be epsilon n. If a ball of radius a big multiple of epsilon n, n times epsilon n, contains all the posterior mass asymptotically as n goes to infinity. And naturally, we're interested in the fastest that we can send epsilon n to zero, so that this is still true. If you make it 10 to zero too fast, 
then you will capture almost no posterior mass. But uh, then we get uh, some information in the rate uh, at which epsilon n can tend to zero. That will depend on the prior that you use. And uh, naturally, we then like priors for which the rate is fast. And a benchmark for such uh, a rate, if you do, for instance, regression or, or other types of uh, curve fitting, or maybe inverse curve fitting, is the usual non-parametric rate of estimation. Uh, if you, you have an unknown function of, say, d variables uh, on a compact in Rd, and uh, the function has uh, derivatives up to some order beta, then the usual non-parametric rate is n to the minus beta over 2 beta plus d. If you have an inverse problem, then it becomes a bit worse with also a factor 2p, where p is, uh, is uh, called the inverse uh, amount, but otherwise it becomes this. And naturally then, uh, if this is the, the rate, the benchmark rate that you can get with kernel estimators, series estimators, and all kinds of other methods, then uh, you would uh, judge the Bayesian method given a particular prior in its ability to get the same rate. And maybe you want more. This, this rate, by the way, is, uh, is usually defined uh, by the, the minimax criterion. That's what I mean by benchmark. But usually we want more because it's also known from uh, non-Bayesian statistics that if you have, say, uh, a range of smoothness levels, beta was the number of derivatives, that could be one, two, or maybe one and a half or, or 10, then you have different models. Then often you can find a single procedure, single estimator that attains this uh, benchmark rate for every beta. And naturally, then we would like that, uh, well, we would like a prior if that gave a posterior that had the contraction rate um, for every beta. So for whenever the true parameter is in theta beta, we would like to attain it, the, uh, the benchmark contraction rate for that beta, and we would like that to be true for all betas. Now here is a basic contraction theorem. Um, so very uh, briefly, um, this gives some results to give you some idea what goes in. This is uh, in a situation that the data is a sample size n from a density. Then uh, we put a metric on the set of densities. Um, well, say the Hellinger distance, uh, for instance, or uh, one that has convex balls and is bounded both by the Hellinger distance. The Hellinger distance is the L2 uh, distance on the root densities as a classical use. Um, so we put that uh, metric and uh, I want to have a posterior rate of contraction relative to that metric. And when is it epsilon n? If you have these two conditions, uh, so they both give, say that epsilon n cannot be smaller than, than something. The first condition, um, is uh, relatively easy to understand because it says that the prior mass pi of the set of densities such that the kubach leipler divergence between the p and the true density p0 uh, is less than epsilon squared should be not too small. It's just saying that there should be enough prior mass close to p0 as measured by kubach leipler and then in exactly this form, uh, greater than or equal e to the minus and epsilon squared, which is in all these examples very small, but you need uh, some basic amount. The second, this is not enough, unfortunately. The second uh, has to do with uh, with the model, not with the prior. And it says that the, the model should not be too complex in this sense of Komogorov of entropy. Um, well, you don't have to look at the full model, but there should be things, uh, subsets uh, of densities called safe sometimes that are not too complex. That's this uh, assumption and that contain almost all the mass. So the complement of the sieve should have very small prior mass. Then it's not important, it maybe complex, but uh, the posterior will not see it because it has very little prior mass. But the 
sieves themselves should not be too complex. And this combo core of entropy is defined here for a given epsilon. It's the number of poles that you need to contra to con to to cover them up. So this this uh, this outer thing is my my uh, thing for the pn, and then uh, you measure how many little balls of radius epsilon you need to cover the pn. Epsilon is very small; you need very many. Well, this gives a bound on how many you're supposed to uh, use, or rather, you work backwards. Of course, you work out what it is as a function of epsilon, and then you determine the epsilon n so that this is satisfied. And then you get some posterior rate of contraction, epsilon n, and then we compare that to the minimax band, uh, benchmark rate. Skip this. Let me just look at uh, some concrete examples where we do get something out, like uh, a Gaussian process prior, very popular for curve estimation. Uh, maybe a uh, surface estimation, or uh, you get some Gaussian process as a model for a function. I guess uh, Gaussian process is just a random a stochastic process where every finite number yeah, has a multivariate distribution. If you use it as a prior, um, you could say, well, I have my intuition, what is reasonable, but that's not so easy. If you would eyeball, say, um, a realization from a Gaussian process, then uh, this is a kind of a humbling thing. The first, uh, I have a realization from Brownian motion, that's a Gaussian process, and you see the weakliness of Brownian motion. Most people would say, well, I don't believe my regression function will be this weakly, so make, make it a bit smoother. Well, you could take the primitive of this. So if this is bt. You could take the integral of B t, bs, sorry, integral t, I have to, ds. So then you make it smoother. You make it, this is a sign kind of a half smooth, and then this is one and a half smooth. Or you could take two primitives, you get two and a half or three and a half smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the nasty thing is that, uh, well, maybe... We can agree this is not a reasonable prior, but the difference that you just see by eyeballing these things is not so big. You don't see the smoothness so so well in a picture. However, these Gaussian processes give very different contraction rates in uh, different situations. And uh, if you would use one of these, then the, the message would be the, to use uh, one that has the smoothness of the true regression function or density. How does that work in the in the theory? Well, there is a theorem saying uh, translating the contraction rate theorem to Gaussian processes, and I don't want to uh, do the details here, but uh, comes down to some condition in terms of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space of the Gaussian process. Every Gaussian process comes with some reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and there is the so-called small ball probability of the Gaussian process. Well, I don't have time to uh, go into detail. So let's just look at a particular example. Um, the data is a sample of size n in a regression model or from some density. If we would use the Gaussian process for a density, we would typically take uh, the Gaussian process as a model for the log density because uh, the Gaussian process is, of course, positive and negative, and the density must be positive. Um, then uh, take... Uh, a particular Gaussian process, very popular in machine learning, which is the square exponential process. It's given by a covariance function that is e to the minus the distance between the two points. So it's the covariance between two points, x and x prime. And the Gaussian process is defined by saying what the covariance is between the, the value of the Gaussian process at this point is e to the minus the distance of these points squared. And I also put a scaling factor tau already in, but take tau is one for the moment or fixed. Then you get results like this. So if tau is one, for instance, then if the true function is analytic, so extremely smooth, then this is a very nice prior. You get the contraction rate from your posterior, which is nearly n to the minus a half. And the point is that this Gaussian process with this 
square exponential covariance function produces sample paths that look very smooth and are very smooth. You can show they are also analytic sample paths. They're infinitely often differentiable. And so you match a truth that's analytic with a Gaussian process of this type. However, then on the other end, things go wrong if theta naught is only ordinary smooth. So say it's uh, six times differentiable, but not seven times. Then the contraction rate will go down, may go down to something very slow. So you get a mismatch between the prior, which says the function is very smooth, and the truth. And suddenly you get almost no contraction just uh, in the logarithm. Now, fortunately, there is this tau parameter. And what you could do is you could put a random scale in the in the in the in the prior. Um, a good one is to uh, if d is the dimension of the curve. My pictures are one dimensional, but you can do this in d dimension. And uh, if tau to the d has a gamma distribution, so you get a scaling. That means this is not the prior for the function, but you take a scaled version of the of that sample pass, the the red one, which is a bit more wiggly, then. Uh, you get the benchmark rate almost if theta naught is uh, beta times differentiable. You get this benchmark well nearly. That means there is a is what I left out is a log factor to some something. But the difference with the benchmark is small, and you actually keep the nice thing about the very smooth case. If theta naught is analytic, you you still get this n to the minus a half, and you could say this prior adapt to the truth if you give it a random scale. So that is this idea that uh, you have kind of automatic uh, bandwidth choice because the posterior will um, just look at the prior. The prior says the bandwidth is this, but the posterior will make its own bandwidth in a way using base, uh, base formula. This Another favorite of uh, of me of this case is where you use uh, where you do density estimation and you model a density as a mixture of Gaussians over location with a mixing distribution f and some scale tau. Uh, what you can do is you can take uh, one over tau here. Uh, tau is, is is the bandwidth. You take it gamma, and you put on a mixing distribution. A Dirichlet process, so completely automatic prior, you could say. I mean, this this is just the prior, and then the prior on the densities will be the induced density by this mixture formula. Uh, and then you have the same nice behavior that that adapts to the true smoothness of the the density, and this is a result that uh, well that started in the early two thousands and took some. 15 years to kind of crystallize out how nice that actually works. Note that we take a Gaussian uh, uh, kernel here, something you cannot do in uh, kernel density estimation, there you would have to use a higher order kernel, so not real densities here, um, to get uh, good results for a higher beta. But here in the Bayesian situation, it's, it's uh, automatic. That was about recovery, and um, the story seems uh, reasonably good. I mean, you can choose priors that work not so well. Um, it's best to have priors that match the truth, but a mismatch you can uh, put in hyperparameters, these bandwidth parameters that uh, repair it, um, and, and you get basically nice results. But there's more that one wants from uh, these Bayesian methods. And, uh, and that's the uncertainty quantification. Bayesians have this notion of credible sets, and that is defined uh, by this formula. It's like a confidence set. It's a set in the parameter space that depends on the data. So it's a random set in such a way, but then it's uh, measured, uh, its mass is measured by the posterior distribution, which is kind of natural. So given the observed data, you get a posterior given x, and then you choose a set such that the probability that theta is in there, the posterior probability, 
is large enough, like 95%. So what shape of the set is that um, if theta is the complex thing, well, there's many shapes you could try. The credible bands are perhaps the most natural. So then you would have that, uh, say, here a central curve. This is actually from an application. It will be the posterior mean. And then you would get some band around that. And you would, uh, you would have a posterior distribution, so random distribution over all these curves. And you would set the width of the bands. Maybe uh, could depend even on the x here. It's a bit narrower, so that the probability under the posterior that you draw a curve that's in the band is ninety five percent. That would be the Bayesian way of uncertainty quantification. If you believe your prior, that is perfect. Uh, nothing, nothing can be uh, brought against it. However, in these very complicated priors. A few examples that I showed you, it would be very hard to say that, uh, okay, this is the only uh, right prior and this is the one you have to use. So we would like to measure also what this means in the non Bayesian situation. And then one idea would be to uh, compare the credible set, as we just defined, to a confidence set. The confidence set is also a set from the data, but we call it a confidence set if the probability that is a random set uh, Cx, where the randomness now is an x, that it covers the theta naught is at least 95% if x comes from theta naught. It's the usual definition of a confidence set. And these two things are obviously different. So there's no guarantee that if you come from the Bayesian world and you find a credible set, that then it will be a confidence set. For parametric models, due to this bernstein von Mises theorem, um, that is fine. If you take a central uh, credible set, then it is a confidence set in this situation. But for non-parametric sit situations, it's not necessarily true. So finite dimensional, yes, everything fine. If you do infinite dimensional, but you would be interested in certain smooth aspects of the, the, the infinite dimensional parameter, uh, it's also fine. Um, but for truly non-parametric, like I estimate a regression function and I'm interested in uh, a confidence band, a credible band, confidence band, uh, the answer is no. Uh, and it, uh, the answer become, is a bit complicated, uh, what, what is happening. Um, it's definitely no in the sense that if you have 95% here, you will not necessarily have 95% there. This is really... Uh, these these numbers, these actual numbers are really on different in different worlds and they don't correspond. But it can be much worse, it can be that you have something big here and zero here, for instance, which would be a sign that our confidence set is uh well that our prior is apparently not working in the way we would like if you're not a full Bayesian. Mostly, the situation is that you get different answers for priors that have a deterministic bandwidth and a data-driven bandwidth. And this picture illustrates what happens if you do a deterministic bandwidth. And it's one particular a situation of a prior. I make here the prior for function theta by expanding theta on some basis, EI are basis functions, say cosines or sines or something. And there's coefficients theta i that uh, are chosen under the prior from, uh, from a normal distribution. So we, we construct a prior on a function by expanding it in a basis and then choosing random coefficients. And the random coefficients that we chose here were Gaussian with a variance that decreases with uh, the frequency. Uh, we need to create a converging series here under the prior. That's why these variances have to decrease so that the theta i's that you generate become smaller and smaller. And a good rate might be i to the minus 1 minus 2 alpha. In the Fourier basis, that would correspond to not only convergence, but you would get functions that have alpha derivatives in some way. Now compare that to a truth, which has also um, 
Fourier coefficients, but they they uh, go down at the rate given by some beta. Uh, I can play with the beta and the alpha. Alpha is beta. I would have that the prior matches the truth. If alpha is bigger, then I'm over smoothing the prior because the coefficients in the prior go faster to zero than in the truth. If alpha were smaller than beta, then I am under smoothing. The coefficients go slower than the truth. The pictures show what happens. Uh, this is over smoothing. So that's alpha bigger than beta. And this is under smoothing alpha smaller than beta. This is matching. And what you see in the picture is some draws from the posterior, the, the black lines, uh, a posterior band, that is the green lines, uh, a posterior mean, that is the red one, and the true curve, which is the black one in all case. So the black one is the same in every every picture, but uh, because the prior is different in these five pictures, the rest is, is different. And if you have a match between alpha and beta, you get that the bands contain the black curve that's not typical this is just one uh, one realization of everything so it doesn't prove anything but it illustrates uh, everything is fine if you take alpha way bigger then you get actually the the band becomes like a line it's so narrow that the upper and the lower curve are on top of each other and you see it does not contain the truth anymore so you over smooth and the posterior will tell you i think the true function is here well, that's not quite true, but it is okay because we are estimating, so we might be a bit wrong. But I would also tell you, I know for sure, almost for sure, that it is uh, there. And it's still true here. It's uh, the band is the uncertainty margin is way too narrow. The posterior has uh, delusions of grandeur. You could say that it thinks it knows what the truth is, but it's absolutely wrong in these three cases. Uh, here it's uh, very uncertain and here it's actually fine. So that's the deterministic bandwidth case in that here the prior is chosen with a fixed alpha and there's different values of alpha. What you can do is also put a prior on alpha and then the question is what uh, will then uh, happen? Will everything be nice or uh, is, are there still problems? One can prove theorems about this picture, but I, I skip the, the, the theorem. Let's look at the data-driven bandwidth. I gave you some examples of priors that have uh, varying smoothness levels, like uh, the rescaled Gaussian process or the serious prior with, uh, you could put uh, a prior on the alpha or you could put a scaling on the on the variance and the Dirichlet process where the, the, the bandwidth is the scale of the Gaussian kernel. And then uh, we put a prior on this bandwidth that gives better recovery. For a smoother true function, you get a better reconstruction, and that is uh, independent of how smooth the function is. Unfortunately, by uh, general statistical theory, that implies that data-driven posterior must be tricked by some truth, and I call them here inconvenient truth, uh, and sometimes the uh, uncertainty quantification must be misleading. That's not really a defect of the Bayesian method because it's impossible to do complete um, uncertainty quantification in non-parametric situation. And the trouble is, uh, is, is here. If you do estimation, then the way we look at that in theory is that we have a, uh, a smoothness level beta. And then we say that uh, for all beta, we want to get some uh, reconstruction rate. But when we do uncertainty quantification, we suddenly want to say that for all theta in the union of all the possible models over betas, we want to have correct uncertainty quantification. And it's this uh, change of saying that for all beta and for all theta in a given theta beta, we want to have something that depends on beta to now for all theta, we want the margin to be correct for all thetas that uh, gives the trouble, and that uh, is true for Bayesian and non-Bayesian uh, approaches. And for Bayesian approaches, maybe the trouble is that you don't see it if you just uh, do um, uh, kind of automatically getting your 
mechanically getting your posterior distribution, you forget that there must be some tricks. Now, one of my last slides, I see I need to finish. Um, so there are inconvenient truths for which it goes wrong. And to give you some idea of what, what these truths are, if you think of uh, a functional parameter in terms of Fourier coefficients that I, I wrote here, uh, theta one, theta two, then an inconvenient function would be one that has some uh, non-zero Fourier coefficients, then some zeros, then some non-zeros, then some zeros, but then more zeros here than here. And where this keeps uh, changing, uh, a posterior will be confused by this sort of pattern in the, in the, the this will give a pattern in the data that will confuse the posterior and basically uh, almost any uh, statistical method. So in that sense, um, uncertainty quantification is uh, is not right. Um, we found a way of excluding that, um, but I will not uh, go through the details here. Um, then you get uh, some theorem in the end that if you exclude the inconvenient truth, then the credible set, that's this one, will become a confident set not uh, that you keep the 0.95, but you do get actually more um, coverage if you scale it up a little bit. Okay, that's uh, where I want to stop. Well, I must stop also for the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it's time for questions. Is there any question? Uh, I will start with the uh, question. Uh, um, so you uh, you consider the case in which you have uh, a sample from a random probability measure, and then uh, you study posterior consistency in the first uh, the, in the middle of the talk. And uh, I ask you uh, if uh, uh, what happens uh, in terms of posterior consistency when you have, uh, for example, two samples. Which are which have been generated by dependent random probability measures. Is there any results for posterior consistency? If the techniques are the same as in the case of uh, uh, only one group of data. Yeah. So dependent probability measure, you mean something like a, a random discrete distribution where the weights are yeah. dependent on some covariate, uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what uh, what happens. I've uh, I haven't studied that, uh, and I I don't I don't think there are results on that uh, at the moment. Do you think it's an interesting uh, open problem, or uh, the the techniques uh, should be similar? A, yeah, I think it's an interesting open problem, and uh, yeah, you you have to think of some. Some what what truth are you then trying to capture with this? Uh, very often, people with dependent uh, measures they want to uh, to model some partitioning in the in the data, and you, you can of course look whether the partitioning would uh, would be back in the posterior. Um, but uh, otherwise, you you have to make models, for instance, uh, conditional densities, and then you you could presumably say something about contraction rates. There must be something actually. I uh, but I I, can, I can't just think of it uh, right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Um. Is there any other question? Uh, if you want, you can raise your hand. I have a question, but perhaps some some of the other participants also wants to ask something. Otherwise, I will ask it. I don't know how to raise my hand, but hopefully I can see. you can hear me. You can see me. Uh, I have some questions about the part where you talked about the credible and confidence sets maybe you can go to those slides yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just caught my attention because my main field is about confidence bands and i'm not sure if i understood right the 
could you explain me once again what can I see in these figures? Pro probably the previous one, I can see that better. So what exactly can we see here? Um, in this particular figure, I, yeah. I, yeah, so this is actually from a data analysis, uh, abundance of a transcription factor as a function of time. And uh, they did just a regression model, but they did it with a Bayesian method. And so what they computed was uh, for every X, they get a uh, posterior distribution for the true mean or they get some and um that is what the bands are here they uh they they say something about the posterior so so uh... you could say that that the the black curve here is the posterior mean and then you could say that if you would generate an other curve from the posterior then the probability that that curve would be between the two dotted bands would be like 90 uh, percent this is probably a dumb question, but I'm not sure I understand what exactly should be in the credible or confidence set. So are we uh, including like functions or distributions or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's say, um, no, let's stick to the theta. So we have a function theta, right? So the black thing is a function and maybe I should uh, have yeah, because in my notations, theta is usually like in a parameter space or denoted something like that. Oh, yeah. No, theta for me is now the function. So um, let's say function. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we, we have theta x, uh, x in uh, 0 to 12 in this case. So it's a function. And the uh, posterior is a complicated uh, object that says that uh, probability, it's a probability distribution on functions. So if I take a set of functions, then given the data, uh, you know, x, n, y, n probably here, because it's a regression problem, um, then that has some value. Now I could take b as the set of all functions that are between the two dotted curves. That would be the credible band, and that would be 95% credible band if that is uh, that mass is 0.95. So in this case, which because we are taking some, so the data is the random, or what is the probability here? <laughs> it's the it's the Bayesian posterior probability. Oh, so okay. We have we have theta comes from a prior, so theta is a random object. Given theta, the data comes from some likelihood. And those two things give the posterior distribution, which is the conditional theta given the data. Yeah, this Bayesian uh, stuff needs some getting used to. Okay, I think I get it now. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, the you. Point, the point is you can do that for theta finer dimensional, but you can also do it with, yeah. with theta being a function. Because in uh, my studies, uh, we usually... Uh, to the confidence band for the regression function itself. So the original function, which generates the data. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's called a credible set, right? So this yeah. is what you can do in the Bayesian framework. This is the definition, but confidence set would be this definition here. And yeah. They're, they're different, yeah. And confidence set is a stricter definition. No, 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 it's not. Or they are, or they are totally different. Uh, They're totally different, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. can't really say if one happens, then the other surely happens. We can't really say something like that. Uh, no. No, okay. No, no, no. And, but in parametric models, they do agree. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, well, I work in non parametric uh, settings. For in a non parametric too, so. setting, <laughs> It's yeah. much more complicated. Yeah, I get it. Thanks for the answers. Yeah, you're welcome. So thank you. We have time for another quick question because uh, uh, in 10 minutes we have the next session. So if uh, there are other questions, please unmute yourself. 
I will just ask one question and we can also extend it. I think it's almost the end of today, so we can extend if there are other questions, my suggestion. But the question might be interesting, at least for those from the patient uh, statistics. So um, you mentioned Bernstein for Mises, which is also noted on this slide. Are there any open problems related also to asymptotic issues related to um, non-parametric patient uncertainty? So naturally, you construct confidence bands and so on. Um, how to study asymptotics and are there any open issues to study in future also here? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think there are many open problems and some of them are possibly very hard. So we we did study, for instance, this correspondence between credible set and confidence sets in basically a setting like this, where we have a sequence model and, and we can manipulate things quite well. But uh, in actual practice, so I, I showed you uh, data assimilation. Um, where is it? Uh, go back. So here I showed you this. Well, now this is a very nasty uh, PDE, but uh, even if you write up a simple PDE, this is a practical PDE, and people just use the posterior, whatever they get. This is a huge this calculation here uh, that probably required a team of people months of programming it's really uh, you have to do all the numerical analysis and then you have to set up simulations you have to do something with priors and it's all very complicated and then they believe that um, the posterior the spread it's not a band here because it's uh, two-dimensional and there's even time uh, a component that, that it means something for the actual world. But the theory is non-existing, saying that that is the case for uh, inverse problems. And so that is one. Uh, I showed you the wonderful Dirichlet mixture uh, models, um, which uh, we know about contraction rate. So I, I really, mm, sorry that I go into all these slides. Um, yeah, here. So we have a beautiful theorem now, uh, which has uh, been around uh, 10 years, about uh, recovery, contraction rates. But we actually know nothing about the confidence statement that comes from this, which you see a little bit in this uh, picture. Uh, you see the some uh, dashed curves here that uh, are draws from the posterior. And the hope would be that somehow uh, that you could make a band that uh, gives you a confidence band. But we, we, we don't know any theory about this. And uh, yeah, this, th those are typical non parametric ones, but there are loads of other questions. This this is maybe 20 years old. Well, if you're young, that sounds like uh, eternity perhaps, but I think it's just starting to, uh, starting to understand it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks.